家好，欢迎来到我们 Crimson Education 还有硅谷百家谈联合主办的 Webinar。今天呢，我们很开心可以请到啊、呃、我们的 CEO Jamie Beaton 来为我们介绍啊、呃、一个教育的一个 pathway。My pathway to building an education empire with Jamie Beaton. 下一页。那我们，我先跟大家大概介绍一下 Crimson 吧。我们 Crimson 呢是一个全球的教育公司，然后我们主力呢就是帮助学生去申请英美呃的大学。我们跟很多不同，我们在不同的公司还有媒体呢都有给给报读过。比如说 Business Insider、Financial Review 等等。下一页，我们也是 The World University Rankings， 还有 US News 的搭档。呃，那证明了我们 Crimson 呢是非常专注于我们的业务的，因为我们在这些很有名的呃媒体跟公司之中都是有呃唯一的合作伙伴。Crimson 呢，在全球有着超过三十个办公室，我们的员工也非常多，还有很多的老师。我们帮助过的学生呢，呃，呃，超过两呃两百 K。那么就是两百 K 呢，是我们在二零一九年做过的一些咨询。然后我们现在的呃活跃的学生也超过五千位。那我先简单的介绍一下 Jamie 吧。Jamie 呢是新西兰人，然后他在高中的时候呢完成了十个 A level， 里面有八个 A star， 两个呃 A。然后呢，他在新西兰也考到很多很多不同的 scholarship。你看到屏幕上面有写着有不同各式各样的一些呃 subject。然后他有九十九呃 percentile 的 SAT score， 然后呢也考了六个 SAT subject test。他申请了全球顶级的二十五所大学，然后呢，他全部都考进去了。之后他也发展了 Crimson， 就是我们现在这个公司。那之后呢，我会交给 Jamie 去介绍一下他自己。Ah,、uh, Jamie, thank you for joining us today. I'm going to pass it over to you to briefly introduce yourself. Fantastic. Awesome. Well,、um, I initially grew up in New Zealand, and when I was about fourteen, I thought I wanted to study in something like medicine or engineering at a local university. But I actually had the、uh, exciting、um, opportunity to meet with a student who was four years older than me, who had actually got it into Yale University, and he told me that I should consider applying overseas. So I spent the next four years kind of building my candidacy towards these top schools,、um, and after a lot of different activities, which I'll run you through today. I was able to get into a wide variety of schools like Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Stanford, Columbia, Cornell, and other interesting schools. And from there, I went off to Harvard, where I did my undergrad and master's degree in applied math. Now, I loved Harvard because I was able to take classes in pretty diverse areas, like, for example,、um, you know,、uh, entrepreneurship and business,、um, ethical reasoning, as well as math, stats, economics, and finance. Um, from there, I worked at Tiger, a top hedge fund, and then moved to Stanford for my MBA education masters. Most recently, I've been doing a PhD at Oxford, focused on online schooling, and have recently begun a law school degree at Yale Law School. And I'm currently in my second year in that program. So I've seen up close and personal, you know, how, what it takes to get into these top schools as I continue to work with the world's smartest young people across the U.S., but also across places like China, Korea, Singapore, Russia. Brazil, New Zealand, Australia, and beyond. So I have quite a global perspective into what it takes to build a top profile for these leading universities. So first of all, you know, I'm going to walk you through some of the strategies that I used、um, uh, in terms of how I got in for you know extra subjects in these programs. So one of the consistent trends across these programs is that you know academic excellence is really seen as a critical success factor. And often this is assessed through how well you do relative to the school curriculum, but also how well you do compared to other students within,、uh, you know, the school that you applied from.、Um, and so、uh, you often want to not only, you know, excel in the traditional school curriculum, but find opportunities for acceleration.、Um, and this is a consistent theme I see across many of my top students. So what does this actually mean? What did I do in my case? 
In high school, I took 10 A-levels, which is the equivalent of about 20 APs. I took A-levels in subjects like English literature, further maths, biology, math, physics, chemistry, but also French, economics, thinking skills, and business. A typical student in the UK would take three or four A-levels, but my 10 A-levels was able to kind of clearly differentiate between me and other students in my school academically, as far as my capacity and curiosity in different subjects. That translated to me getting into 25 of the world's top universities. Um, I also focused deeply on English and math, with English being developed through things like Model UN, debating, case competitions, and beyond, which led me to scoring top in the world in IGCSE English language and, and also top in the world in A-level English literature. I also focused on math, where I did IGCSE maths, AS, A2 maths, as well as university level math. And when I got to Harvard, I was able to skip a number of the introductory math courses, actually skipping a whole year of my Harvard degree using advanced standing, and then also being able to do my, do my MBA at a much younger age than normal, actually being the youngest person to do a Stanford MBA in the last 20 years. So grades and scores are a big part of getting in, but they're not all that matters. Here's the chart which shows how the acceptance rate to Yale University has declined over time. Back in 2007, it would take about 12% applicants. But today, it's down to um, you know, less than 5.6% uh, as of 2021. The total number of applications received has continued to grow. Um, and what's interesting is that actually, there continues to be a really strong um, academic uh, background. And Sophie has just asked for our website. So I'll just put a link in the description here. Let's go to the next slide. So um, here's some interesting data on um, Princeton admits. And what you can see here is actually, if you have a perfect GPA at Princeton University, still only 9.4% of people get in. If you have an SAT score on the top 100 points, only 8.2% of people in that band get into Princeton. So what this means basically is even when you have very strong academics, you still are not getting in at 30% or 40% of the time, which means that actually uh, there's much more to this than just the academic equation. These are the extracurriculars that I did when I was in high school. I took Duke of Edinburgh um, at the gold level. I did different Olympiads, the Math, Biology and Chemistry Olympiad. I also did engineering competitions, economics competitions, and I was involved in Model UN in my city, nation, and on the international stage. I was involved in Young Mensa, a high IQ society, as well as debating and also theater. I created two companies or two organizations. The first was a, a company called Number 8 Technologies, which helped students, uh, sorry, helped parents looking um, at Google Maps in their car by making iPad stands. Um, and the second was a, a group called Don't Stand By Stand Up, similar to America. In my country, New Zealand, had a big problem with underage drinking and underage drugs. And so I created this initiative in response to some students who had passed away from my school for, for drugs and alcohol as a way to keep other students safe um, when they were socializing on weekends. I also created my school's first newspaper, The King's Echo, as well as the Amnesty International Club, and even had some part-time work experience at a burger shop called a Porto, which actually fed into my essay, which became quite viral online, being covered by groups like Business Insider, um, which you can read about on the internet if you're curious. So I started working on my essays in, my, in February of my last year, and I wrote three key drafts for my main application essay. I'll actually be exploring this in a book that I have, I'm have i releasing in the US in partnership with my publisher, Wiley, in February of 2022. Um, when you apply, I also got five different recommendation letters and applied to a large number of schools. Um, and I applied to schools not only in the US, but also in the UK and other geographies like the Middle East, Singapore, Australia, and New Zealand. And you know, with every country I applied to, it sort of diversified as well, um, my application because each country has slightly different assessment criteria. Fortunately, I didn't really need all of that um, because ultimately I got into all the US programs that I applied for, for the most part. But I think, um, you know, it's still a good strategy for most of our students to use. Many of our students will apply to the US, the UK and some other countries. So the, now what led me to create Crimson and also Crimson Global Academy? I'm gonna walk you through kind of this process because um, it has come from quite a personal place. So when I was in high school, I was very frustrated by traditional schooling experiences. 
The reason why is I sat in these classes with 20 or 30 students, but I felt like it was often a waste of time because the teachers, you know, varied in ability, even though I was at some of the strongest schools in my country. Um, and, you know, subjects like math, the school was only one year ahead, which meant that often, you know, school wasn't particularly challenging as it isn't for many of my students. So I used seven different tutors in areas like math, English, biology, chemistry, physics, French, and the SAT to help me get through the subjects like further maths, 140 hours of course content in 30 or 40 hours. I also um, was able to then get into 25 of these top universities. Fast forward to Harvard, and I actually met um, my classmates, 1,600 classmates from around the world, many of which had really the same experience as me. Harvard is usually made up of people that were exceptions to the typical education pathway. So it's worth noting, you're never gonna get into Harvard if you just follow a conventional academic path. Um, most of my students, and I've sent at this point more than 30 students to Harvard, um, you know, pursued quite a unique strategy. And I'm gonna show you one of these examples later on. One of my boys, I recently got into Harvard, not only into Harvard, but, but from China, from Shanghai Foreign Language School with a Chinese passport, which is one of the most difficult things to accomplish in the world of admission. I launched Crimson when I was 18 years old after having many families reach out to me to seek my guidance and approach to college admissions. I also finished my Harvard degree in only three years, two years faster than normal with a bachelor's and master's degree. And I did this by taking six classes per semester and also skipping a full year of my degree. Now, many people told me that I should do my MBA when I was a lot older, but I thought that was silly because I was in the process of building my company and I wanted the kind of deep management training you got from Stanford Business School, um, which is currently America's highest ranked MBA program. When I was at Stanford, I saw the Stanford Online High School and I was very inspired because I saw that, you know, there was a lot of American students using the school to boost their academic profile and take potentially their whole high school diploma. When I was at Stanford, I also took my master's in education. Um, I moved to Oxford and at Oxford, I began collaborating with Tommy Hirohoshi, who's the head of the Stanford Online High School and today one of our closest advisors at Crimson. Um, this led me to launch the Crimson Global Academy, our online high school, which enables students to take both extra APs and A-level subjects from around the world. Um, I also did my PhD focused on online schooling, one of the first in the world to focus on this topic actually prior to COVID. So now what does Crimson do? Um, really my, my objective with launching Crimson is to make sure students across the world have the support they need to really maximize their academic potential and in doing so getting into their dream universities and dream career paths. So we offer a lot of different types of training um, from academic tutoring to preparation competitions like VEX, Olympiads, AMC and beyond, of course mastery courses for the SAT and the ACT, training for entrance exams like for example the UK entrance exams like the BMAT, LNAT and beyond, language training in subjects like English as well as of course our online high school where students can study full-time or part-time, and it's actually registered in Florida. On the extracurricular side, we've become you know, pretty famous around the world for extracurricular support. This is why leading organizations like US News have chosen to exclusively partner with Crimson over any other kind of counseling company in the US, which generally aren't that sophisticated compared to other parts of the world like Korea or Singapore. Um, on the extracurricular mentoring side, we help students figure out what activities to take, um, how to boost their profile in these areas, and then training for these particular activities. We also do leadership development where we help students launch their own projects, initiatives, and campaigns. One of my students, for example, who just got into Harvard, um, uh, he was involved in a auto-tuning violin project, which actually got two patents. And a recent trend I've seen is lots of my students doing patents um, has actually been admitted to places like Harvard and Stanford. So it's quite a novel strategy. Social entrepreneurship, where you launch your own project, similar to what I did in high school, launching my, my campaign called Don't Stand By, Stand Up. The internship opportunities that we also help students with, and we give you access to in-person and remote opportunities across the US. Some of my students recently have taken advantage of our exclusive partnership with PricewaterhouseCooper to do an internship while in high school. We also have an extracurricular marketplace where you can search for opportunities around the US and the world, and also our research institute where you can take and perform research with more than 50 professors from top universities, and then go ahead and get published in journals. Like our student Ashley, who just got into Stanford after being published in paleobiology. So um, we really see ourselves as a bit of an ecosystem designed to really nurture your potential. Although our, our flagship service of college admissions 
it's really, I guess, regarded around the world as the you know, major provider. Um, we also have a variety of other types of support which you can take advantage of. First up is our Crimson community. Think about this like a Facebook for college admissions for our high achieving students around the world, where our students can join groups with other like-minded ambitious students across the world. When you're applying from high school, you can't really collaborate that closely with your classmates applying in the same cycle, because ultimately you're directly competing with them. So when I was applying to Harvard, I didn't really want to collaborate with my um, you know, fellow classmates in the same year group, because ultimately we were applying to the same institution. So often my students find that it's sort of annoying because they've got to collaborate with younger students um, or they struggle to find collaborators for their projects. Inside Crimson Community, you can actually find people across the Crimson Network from more than 20 countries to launch projects in different geographies. And this is a really powerful way to um, you know, uh, make friends as well and go through the stressful college admissions process with peers. We have daily events with experts like myself and people that have you know, gone to these top schools or gone to these top careers they might be doing investment banking, management consulting, technology jobs. They might be entrepreneurs and Y Combinator. And they're doing talks to our students in our own community, which is pretty exciting and a real differentiator of Crimson in our network. Um, as I mentioned before, many of our students will, will use our internships with you know, uh, many organizations around the world, across San Francisco, LA, other parts of the US. I've had students intern for hedge funds. I've had students intern for tech companies. Um, you know, interesting social enterprises and beyond. And a lot of students actually don't really have the ability to source their own internship, but they can actually do quite a lot of good things once they give them the opportunity. So we like to provide these internships to our students. Now, Crimson also exclusively partners with leading organizations like the Harvard Crimson. So here's one of the competitions we've recently run. We do many a year. This one's called the Harvard Crimson Global Essay Competition where we collaborated with Harvard's um, club, the Harvard Crimson, the oldest club at Harvard, to launch a global essay competition where students can actually compete, submit essays, and then use these results on their common application. Um, this was very popular with more than 2,000 competitors with lots across the US. Now, we're also known for our really solid free resources. Um, of course, our serious families go on and use our, you know, paid consulting services, but um, we have many resources families can use. So we have, you know, hundreds of webinars that we run around the world. Um, we do more webinars in a typical week and month than any other college missions firm um, around, around the globe, partially because we have such a big network of um, officers and experts within the Crimson community. So in a given week, you might hear from a former missions officer from UChicago, from NYU, from UPenn, we might have an open house in the U.S., as well as a deep dive into the common application. So plenty of great content, mum and dad can attend, your children can attend as well, um, which is really useful to give you a sense of the kind of expertise we have and also learn a lot before you even join us as a student. We also have the leading podcast on college admissions, the most popular podcast on Spotify. So by all means, follow the podcast. We've got two different types of content. The first is college tips where we interview our successful students that have gone into these top schools and you can hear a lot of different you know interesting insights there as well as our you know top of the class um podcast where you can hear from leading students around the world like our recent interview with the times student of the year a, a young american girl at the age of 15 became the Times scientist of the year uh, for the youth category we also have a scholarship for lower income students, particularly focused on students across the US, where you can apply to get funding for our services, totally free of charge, based on your financial income and background. So if you're on today's call and wouldn't necessarily be able to afford Crimson's paid consulting services, there is opportunity to take advantage of our support through the Crimson Axe Opportunity Scholarship. We also have some leading calculators and you can use our calculators to get odds into your admissions probabilities. Um, once you're a student at Crimson, we have a very powerful calculator we use, built by our data scientists. As I said, I was an applied math student at Harvard. My, my chief operating officer also went to Harvard and Goldman Sachs, and he did data science. And our algorithm that we use um, looks at extracurriculars, academics, financial aid status, passport status, and a variety of other considerations like IB or AP scores, etc. To give you an estimated probability of admission to a whole range of top schools, which helps to inform the kind of safety, match, and reach skills we help our clients apply for. 
Now, we also have the most popular YouTube channel in the US for college missions. So we encourage you to check it out. It's called Crimson Education, no surprises there. Um, and we have some really viral videos uh, where we've filmed our mentors at top schools that have you know, gone through a day in their life at these institutions to give you a sense of what it's like to actually study there. So you can actually use this to get a sense of what these schools are like before you do your campus tours to figure out what schools you want to visit. And also we do some quite detailed dives into people's profiles and applications. So plenty of fun content there to watch. Um, this is our extracurricular database. We actually have the only major centralized database of extracurricular opportunities in the world, where you can search for upcoming opportunities across the US during the summer, and also um, you know, on a global stage, online and in person. Our extracurricular advisors will help you figure out what activities are most relevant to you. And you can also use this to post opportunities for your own clubs and initiatives to recruit fellow Crimson students to join you, which is pretty cool. Because many students will struggle to find participants for their projects, but not do this and through our community. You can often fill them up quite quickly with other like-minded, like ambitious students who want to participate in different initiatives. And we also have a lot of university profile pages where you can learn about different schools in more detail, uh, which is a good way as you're doing your school research to take a bit of a deeper dive. And of course, our popular blog, where we analyze all things college missions, high performance academics, and other relevant trends to the college missions world. Um, so it's a great opportunity for you guys as parents to keep updated on the process and hear from our experts on a regular basis, typically every couple of days. Now, Crimson's culture is really student outcome obsessed. That comes from our personal love of learning, our love of academics. And so you can see during each accepted cycle, this year was 2025, just the huge excitement we have as our students get in around the world. These are screenshots from our student from our students flat community, where we're celebrating different students around the world getting into these top schools. Um, and you can see everyone just getting so excited about these results. These are our strategists sharing the great pride they have as their students are getting in from around the world to all these different top universities. Now, here's one of my favorite cases. One of my students that I trained for more than four years who got into Harvard from Shanghai Foreign Language School with a Chinese passport. Some of you on the call today may have a Chinese passport and know that it's a bit harder to get in with that background. But Crimson has experience helping students getting into the most competitive institutions in the world. There aren't many firms that have actually helped people from mainland China getting into Harvard because obviously it's only about 10 admits per year. But recently we did it this cycle. And one of our students, he scored a 15 15 in the SAT. We helped him to take 17 AP exams. This may sound pretty hard, but if you want to get into top schools, particularly Harvard and Stanford, and you have a Chinese passport, you need to perform you know, quite an interesting strategy to make that realistic. So over the course of three years, we took 17 APs, we got two patents, we launched different music projects, including concert reviews for the Shanghai Symphony Orchestra, virtual internships at an interesting AI company in London. We launched different things like a, like a, a symphony orchestra, um, sorry, I mean a conducting um, orchestra um, opportunity the student was involved in, as well as a lot of different community service projects as well. Um, so uh, good to show you, know, you guys that we do have experience not only getting Americans into these top schools, which is actually a little bit easier, but even international students from the most competitive countries in the world, like Korea and China, which is actually a lot harder than getting Americans into places like Harvard and Stanford. This is one of my students' songs. He's currently actually working in Silicon Valley. He came from New Zealand. We helped him take many additional subjects and A-levels, did, did different leadership projects, got into the Biology Olympiad. Then from there, he got into Caltech. Um, at Caltech, he began working at Google's Waymo team their autonomous driving unit, as well as um, working for NASA. And now he works for Tesla, which is super cool, um, for Elon Musk. Um, he's also heading off the MIT soon, where he got into a master's program, and he's got a, he got a 4.0 GPA. So a great example of one of our students who's you know, been able to actually really thrive in their career. And this is what we see kind of across the board. We train our Crimson students very well, and not only what it takes to get in, but also succeed. Most people that do college admissions haven't really had practical success in their life and their careers. They've sort of always been in this kind of like college admissions niche, but that doesn't really teach you much about what it takes to succeed in the actual job marketplace. We have lots of my, fir my firm and team we used to work for top banks like Goldman Sachs, hedge funds like Tiger where I worked. And so we've actually seen what it takes to work in these leading industries. 
so we can train our students successfully along this way. And we also have our Crimson Careers Unit. This is another one of my students, Samil. Um, we trained him from the age of 14. We helped him take AP Computer Science and a bunch of extra A-level subjects like English and Business. We helped him to become the head boy of his school and launched various initiatives. He got onto Harvard and then he worked at Bridgewater, the world's biggest hedge fund, but the fund didn't stop there. He did the Harvard Innovation Lab and then he got into Y Combinator, Silicon Valley's top accelerator, which many of you guys would have heard of. Um, y Combinator is responsible for launching great companies like Airbnb, DoorDash and Brex. And he's gone on now to raise more than $150,000 for his company. And he's building that right now in Silicon Valley. Um, so he, he's a huge advocate for Crimson. And you can read about a story all over the international media in publications like USA Today, as well as the National New Zealand Herald, where it's on the front page of this national newspaper. So you know, Crimson has more student results than any other admissions counseling firm in the US. Um, and you know, a lot of these students have gotten into the most competitive programs that exist. So there's not many competitive programs we haven't sent students to. I haven't come across one in more than two years. So our students have gotten into, you know, obviously all the Ivies, but not just a couple of times. We've sent more than 41 kids to Harvard, 37 to Yale, 23 to Princeton, 45 to Columbia, 21 to Dartmouth, 45 to Brown, uh, 96 into UPenn, 43 Cornell, 54 Oxford, 72 Cambridge. This is why the top organizations in the world like HSBC, US News and Times hired use us, as well as China's top international school, Derway, Alex International which some of your extended family may have heard about um, in Shanghai, Beijing, and other parts of China. We have more than 300 offers to the Ivy League um, and you know, more than 100 Oxford and Cambridge collectively. And here are our results from just this application cycle. 12 to Princeton, 10 to Stanford, three to MIT, you know, nine to Yale, very solid results. Um, and even in the most competitive admissions year ever, we broke our record for the most results to these different schools. So we've really seen what it takes across the board. We've even sent students to Juilliard and also to Columbia Juilliard, as well as other combined dual degrees at places like UPenn, such as the Huntsman program, which I also got into, um, the Vagilos Life Science Management program, as well as other interesting programs like UPenn's Digital Media Design or Brown and the Rhode Island School of Design's you know, powerful dual degree program. So we've really um, you know, kind of done it all, I guess, in the college admission space. Here are some of our alumni um, with the schools they've gone to study at. As you join Crimson, we're more than happy to show you many of our case studies. Our students are so proud of being part of Crimson and many of them have gone on to achieve exciting things in Wall Street, Silicon Valley and beyond. Many of these faces um, I'd speak to on a regular basis. Um, you know, uh, top left, I think of Lucas, who's, who went to Harvard, he's now at Wall Street. Um, I, I think of, you know, Martin Luck there, who's at Cambridge, who now works for a top hedge fund in the UK called Man Group. I think of folks like Shuri, who went to Caltech, she's now at Goldman Sachs. Um, Amanda, who went to UPenn, who's now working in Silicon Valley for an AI company. Um, you know, just really exciting opportunities across the board. Um, so uh, feel free to inquire about what career pathways our students have pursued. Our students today are working at BCG, Bain, McKinsey, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, Google DeepMind, the leading AI team, SoftBank, Bridgewater, Facebook, many, many, many of these awesome companies. So um, we really focus it from not only getting our students into these elite schools, but also landing in the most competitive jobs in the world, um, which is kind of the point of taking these top degrees ultimately for many of our ambitious students. So it's important that we deliver those results to our families. So I take great pride in telling um, our students success and hopefully I'm telling your own story in the near future as part of one of our seminars around the world. Um, with that, I'm very happy to take any question and answers. Thank you, Jamie, for presenting to us. Uh, now we are moving on to Q&A. So first question, uh, Jamie, are you still working at Target Investment or is Crimson your full-time investment? Uh, no, Crimson is my full-time investment. So I've been working full-time on Crimson since 20, 2016. But what's quite interesting for you to know is we've raised a lot of money from Tiger. So Tiger is actually our largest uh, investor shareholder. And um, uh, has invested more than about 35 million US dollars into Crimson. So the other thing is Crimson is one of the only venture capital backed college admissions firms in the world. Um, and we're backed by Tiger Global, 
which is the leading venture capital firm within our category. Um, and they were early investors in New Oriental and Teleeducation Group, but also leading technology companies like Uber, Didi in China and other interesting organizations. So, um, you know, Crimson's backed by some hedge funds across, you know, Silicon Valley, uh, across um, New York uh, and various international groups as well. Thank you. And, you know, um, just, just some quick numbers. Yeah. Crimson has more than 400 employees, more than 20 offices and thousands of mentors. So we have more full-time staff than any other college admissions firm in the world. Amazing. Uh, second question, how do you secure your first investment? Oh, interesting. Um, so when I was in New Zealand, I met up with this guy called Julian Robertson who recently was in the Financial Times. Um, he's known as the Wizard of Wall Street. He's a billionaire who lives in New York. Now, Julian Robertson, um, when I met him, um, I didn't win a scholarship initially, but I reached out to him after getting into Harvard and working for a hedge fund in Boston called the Weiss Asset Management Hedge Fund. So um, uh, when I met up with him, um, you know, he gave me his, he introduced me to his um, psychologist who gave me an IQ, EQ and psychology test. Um, and I was able to perform well in this assessment. So he hired me to work at Tiger, and he also invested in Crimson way back in 2013, 2014, sorry. Um, he also then introduced me to a variety of other strong investors, and that became our seed round capital. So we raised 1 million USD back when I was 19. Um, although now we've gone on to raise uh, more than 57 mil USD. And you'll see shortly in the international media, we're about to close our next round of capital, which is quite exciting. Cool. And another question from Tina. Did you uh, did your Harvard and other uni experience help you in any way? Yeah, they were hugely valuable. By going to Harvard, I was able to find my co-founder, um, David Freed, who um, runs the company. You know, we have hundreds of mentors from Harvard on our platform. So, you know, um, we have more mentors from Harvard than any other organization because we've, you know, I, I personally went there with a lot of my team. I learned a lot from my education experiences there. I was able to actually do my thesis under Larry Summers, who was the former president of Harvard. Larry Summers, you know, was the chief economist of the World Bank, and he's actually now an advisor to Crimson Education. So I was able to recruit the former chief economist of the World Bank to work within our organization, um, you know, because of that Harvard relationship. And then um, at Harvard, of course, I was able to get, you know, the opportunity to work at Tiger. Um, and I was also able to, you know, meet many inspiring classmates. Um, when I went on to... Um, uh, you know, Stanford, um, I then, you know, did, uh, of course, my MBA. And at Stanford, you know, one of my classmates went on to a hedge fund who then invested almost 10 million US dollars into Crimson. So, of course, you know, that invested network's very valuable. And then um, I also recruited one of my classmates to launch Crimson in Japan. And Crimson is the most, uh, is the leading college missions firm in Japan as well. Uh, and our online high school is very popular there. So, of course, it's been very valuable. Um, uh, yeah. So definitely, I mean, my academic background has been the single most powerful advantage we've had at Building Crimson. Cool. Uh, there are lots of great questions. Please keep them coming. We have enough time to answer your questions. So please feel free to ask us anything about university or your pathway and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then one question from Emma. When selecting an MBA program, why do you choose Stanford over Harvard? Um, so Stanford is generally regarded as the highest ranked MBA program in the world right now. So it usually tops all the rankings. Um, Harvard MBA is, of course, really strong, but the difference rate to Harvard Business School is usually about, you know, between 13 to 16%, where the Stanford, Bus Stanford Business School is usually about 6%. I'd already been to Harvard for undergrad and for master's. So I already had two Harvard degrees. Um, so I figured I should get my next two from a different place. And also, you know, um, Stanford is in the middle of Silicon Valley. Um, and what that means is that people really want to work in technology. They want to create their own companies at Stanford. Whether you're at Harvard Business School, is, there is some focus on entrepreneurship, but there's mainly focus on working in finance, with top hedge funds, et cetera. And I'd already done that, um, you know, sort of skipped all the banks and have begun working at a hedge fund. So I figured I could learn more from my Stanford MBA. Um, and, you know, that uh, was going to be a more, you know, powerful experience there. Um, and it turned out to be really accurate. Um, also, I like Stanford because a lot of the students focus on social impact. I don't build an education company, um, you know, just to build a good business. I really care about my students and I have done, you know, personally work with students myself every year, about 10 VIP or 15 VIP clients around the world. 
And I enjoy this because, you know, as we get larger and larger, we impact more students' lives and can have a very transformative role with them. And I like my classmates at Stanford because they have that similar social impact focus. So that's some of the reasons why I chose Stanford Business School over Harvard Business School. Cool. And I think you sort of mentioned uh, acceptance rate in your previous answer. Richard is asking, what's the percentage of the successful acceptance rate? Um, so uh, when I got onto Harvard, you mean is it for business school or for every, for every program? Uh, he didn't mention, but let's talk about okay. Harvard. Sure. So at Harvard, the acceptance rate was um, about 5% or 5.5% when I got in. Um, at Stanford Business School, the acceptance rate was 6% when I got in. I also have a Rhodes Scholarship, which is the most competitive academic scholarship in the world. Um, that's less than 2%. And then, of course, the Yale Law School is less than 7%. Um, and Yale Law School has some very high entry stats. So I was actually really honored to get into that program. Cool. And as we all know, your mother is also a very strong woman. And someone is asking, how do you think your upbringing shaped your career? So growing up, I was very close to my mother. Um, you know, I think most successful, you know, students I see have a family that is really supportive of them. Um, and, you know, are really committed to their education. So my mum was kind of uh, up until the age of 11. She knew, you know, all of the academic content of my classes probably better than I did. She used to train me and I remember sitting in like a Wendy's and she would train me in like history and social studies and stuff. Then when I got into high school, um, you know, I really was kind of running my own race. I'm finding my own tutors and stuff. I was quite self-motivated, but my mum was my emotional support system. I put myself through huge amounts of stress going through high school because I was trying to, you know, build a really competitive profile taking more than double as many subjects as everybody else. And so that meant that I was often feeling a lot of pressure at home. And my mum was always there for me um, through those critical moments. So um, she played a really great role there um, and continues to be, you know, one of my closest advisors, even as I build Crimson, um, you know, we're about to pass a half a billion dollar equity valuation for the business. And there aren't many people that I can talk to to get really serious, frank advice. My mum's always there for me. So I'm being very close with her across the whole academic and education and business journey. Amazing. Uh, next question. Can you please share your motivation of applying to so many top colleges as this is a very tough process as we all know? Yeah, sure. Um, the first thing is I wasn't sure what I could get into at the time. And to me, honestly, like it seems when, when I sit back and look at it, education is just so high stakes. The students that I send to Harvard, Stanford, Wharton go on to have these very powerful careers. And the students who miss out end up, you know, having much less successful careers. It's quite like clockwork. And it's very hard for students who miss out on these good opportunities to actually get back on that high achieving path. Because, for example, take my Stanford MBA. There were 40 kids from Harvard, 35 kids from um, Stanford in my MBA program. And, you know, it's way harder to get in from, you know, even lower ranked schools like UCLA, even though UCLA is quite a good school. So basically for me, I just didn't want to take any risks because, you know, I was very ambitious for my own career. And so I wanted to make sure that I had, you know, multiple tiers of backup schools. Um, and I figured I'd already put in all the work to create a very strong candidacy. I may as well apply to many different institutions. And um, I also had done many of my essays well in advance. So even though I got into Harvard in the early round, I still just submitted all my other applications as well because I already had them ready. So um, that's kind of why I applied to a variety of schools. After getting into Harvard and many other schools, I was much more sniper-like with my graduate degrees. I just applied for the top one or two every time. And fortunately, I've gotten into them. So um, when I applied to law school, I applied to Yale and Harvard, gone, you know, and no other school. I've gone to them both, went to Yale, for example. So um, once I had the kind of confidence of my undergrad degree in academics during that time, I was much more comfortable to only apply to one or two programs each time. Cool. Uh, and then can you tell us a bit more about Crimson Rice program? Uh, someone's wondering what does it include and What's the cost of it? And do you have students in the Crimson Rise program that are, who are not high achieving students? Yeah, sure. So when I think about building Crimson, I think about what are the services I would want my own children to have in this world? Um, and what is the support they would need to be really kind of competitive? Um, so I guess, you know, if my mum was having me again, or if I was having my own child, what do I need to equip them for success? And one of the things that's obvious to me is that you can't just begin this process when you're like 14 to 18. Because age 14 to 18, you're actually already being assessed by these US schools that's going into your candidacy. So Crimson Rise is for 10 to 14 year olds. 
to actually start developing the extracurriculars, time management, communication skills, debate skills, things like coding, language skills, et cetera. We work with students with a wide variety of academic backgrounds. Some of our students actually haven't been very academic, but are in Crimson Rise. Others are quite academic. And we help them find enrichment courses and help them actually become ready for the competitive phase that is high school. So that's a really useful program, particularly if you're thinking about really top schools, because you want to have that early beginning foundation before you embark on high school and you're kind of on the clock running this competitive race. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, what's your advice to a current 11th grade student? If you're currently in 11th grade, I mean, there's a lot of considerations. The first is basically um, give your current five academic honors. What are you going to be applying to college with as your top achievements? If you don't have five yet, we need to think about what they are and what level they are as well. Um, think about, you know, have you done enough, you know, things like research, internships, some programs, um, and then, you know, what's your school GPA, standardized test score? Are you taking additional subjects? If so, in what area and why? Have you taken any course your classes? Um, and, you know, uh, also, you know, how, how are you going as far as leadership roles? So I would take you through about a, a bit of a diagnostic on different aspects for candidacy, figure out where your deficiencies are, and then from there help you to kind of build up to those top skills. So um, I think with only about you know, 18 months left, if you're currently in grade 11, um, even shorter actually, you know, you really have to uh, make sure that you know where your deficiencies are so you can focus on them and kind of quickly build them up that final phase. Amazing. And do you have any recommendations for high schoolers uh, in terms of ECL, if they want to get into finance and entrepreneurship? You bet. Finance and entrepreneurship is one of my most popular areas. So we have the Tiger Global Case Competition. Um, we partner with Tiger Global to release the case competition with more than 2,000 competitors around the world during COVID. That's happening again shortly in 2021. So you can compete in that. There's also MIT's Launch X program. You can do some um, extra APs with us, like AP Micro, AP Macro. You could take things like A-level business studies. You can do things like you know, monetary policy challenges. Um, you could create um, different organizations. You could do YC Startup School here in Silicon Valley, um, part-time online. There's a whole variety of things we could recommend for you as well uh, um, across both finance and entrepreneurship to build your profile. That's a really classic one for us. We have many students with this background. Amazing. Uh, everyone, please make sure you uh, are aware of the Tiger Global Case Competition. It is a very, very well organized competition and it really helps you to achieve more in terms of extracurriculars and leadership. And then we have a Chinese question, but I'm going to translate into English. Uh, when you are, when we are helping some non high achieving students from uh, non-top university to apply for MBA, uh, how's the successful rate? And then is it going to be really difficult if students applying to a top university for MBA from a non-top university? Yeah, generally, if you apply to a top MBA program for a non-top university, you're probably not going to get in, generally, most of the time, to be honest, because the students that are getting into these top programs normally have a very strong background. As I mentioned at Stanford Business School, there were 40 kids from Stanford undergrad, sorry, 40 kids from Harvard undergrad, 35 kids from Stanford undergrad. There was only a handful of kids from like say UC Berkeley, and then the odds dropped to zero for most universities around the world. So um, we have to carefully diagnose your current GPA, your current university, your work experience, and then figure out what's realistic, and then prepare you accordingly. We have a really uh, strong track record in MBA, and um, we've seen people to you know Harvard, Stanford, Wharton, I've sent people to MIT. Um, you know, one of my students recently, uh, you know, got into the two plus two program. Um, we just, we, we, I was actually just training one of my students um, the other day who just had her HBS interview uh, a couple of days ago. So, um, you know, we, we definitely can provide support here, but we have to kind of assess your profile. And, you know, we're very realistic and honest with you around what you can actually get into. Um, but yeah, generally, if you're applying from a non-top tech university, you won't be able to get into a top MBA. Um, so we should assess your odds to see if it's possible. Yeah, so please feel free to contact us if you're interested. We will share some QR code later on in the webinar. Um, so yeah, you can scan those QR codes and you will be able to add us and ask more questions. Now moving on to the next one uh, from RS. Were you a well-rounded student at school or were you particularly strong in certain subjects? Um, 
I would say I was quite well-rounded. In English, I scored top in the world in my A-level English literature, um, which was, um, you know, sort of my best subject. So English was my best subject, but I did a lot of math and science activities as well. So I would say my profile kind of had, um, you know, some well-rounded academic foundations. Um, as I see a lot of our students who get into Harvard and Stanford do as well, it's not that common to have a student with a big weakness in one area getting into Harvard or Stanford. Um, but we can definitely assess your child and see kind of what's appropriate given their current academic ability. Cool. Uh, and the next question, we have someone asking, uh, is it too late or is there still time to seek Crimson's help for a rising senior? Um, of course, it's relatively late in the process, but every year we help a lot of rising seniors successfully getting in. So um, by all means, we can definitely still support you. Um, we can take a look at what you've done so far and then we can help you on all the essays and um, we can help you on all of the common application um, and also we can probably find some additional activities you can do quite quickly uh, you know that you can add to your profile so definitely there's tons of value we can add there um, so it would have been good to start earlier but you know definitely we should jump in now if you still have some time before you apply great uh, next one your academic is very strong, but now it seems that selective college uh, care less about academic. A lot, many colleges are scraping SAT tests, uh, stuff like that. So what should students do? Actually, this is a big mistake. So um, take my boy, Andrew, who just got into Harvard from China. So colleges actually, um, while they've become SAT optional, they still heavily look at academic results and actually, um, almost every student, we sent 25 kids across Harvard and Stanford this year into these schools, um, you know, they had very strong academics. So like take Andrew, he had 17 AP exams, 17 AP fives, right? So um, actually um, thriving in the academics is still very necessary. Of course, you can add ex extra initiatives. So, you know, we can help you launch leadership projects. Many of our students do apps, YouTube channels, podcasts, different initiatives, fundraisers. Um, on our YouTube channel, you can see one of my students, Felicia. At the age of 15, she ran a COVID fundraiser where she painted 85 pieces of art with a local artist, um, put words in them like, you know, xenophobia, lockdown, et cetera. And then she was able to auction them successfully and give the money to a local hospital. So we have our students with all kinds of powerful projects and competitions and stuff. Um, but, you know, by all means, if you, you can't neglect the academics because that's the most important foundation for the achievement. And we continue to see that throughout this application cycle. So um, we can, of course, um, help you across both academics and extracurriculars, um, but it's, you know, not good to neglect the academic because that's still the most popular criteria for admission. Cool. Uh, and then on the screen, we have a QR code. If you're interested in getting more uh, personal questions answered, you can scan the QR code. We are going to answer a few more live over here and then we will be moving on to the next part. So next question for you, Jamie. Uh, do you have any tips or recommendation for college essay writing? Yeah, definitely. I mean, college essay writing is really exciting. Um, I was actually just writing my college essay writing chapter for my book coming out next year and in February, um, which, you know, um, was is actually going to do a deep dive into this topic. But basically, um, long story short, I take my students through a comprehensive brainstorming process we find the you know 10 to 15 most influential impactful emotional moments in the life that can involve moments of family conflict adversity challenge it can involve instances of cultural clash it can involve you know failure etc finding these major moments and then from there finding the stories that underpin them um, if you want you can search for my own application essay which you can read in business insider and um, you can see that i use you know, creative writing techniques extensively throughout that. We work with our students to really use a lot of simile, metaphor, alliteration, other language techniques to make sure their essay is very powerful. And um, uh, then we, you know, really try to think about what characteristics we, we want to convey in our students. Um, we have a lot of experience with this, um, particularly with students with the Chinese background. Recently, one of my students who got into Harvard wrote an essay about playing cricket, being the only Chinese student to play cricket in his particular city. And, um, you know, combining that passion for learning cricket with his um, interest in weather. And so it was a really interesting essay, which, you know, uh, you use the analogies of um, clouds developing um, as a metaphor for his skill in cricket developing in this kind of unknown new frontier. And it was quite a funny comical essay. 
So, um, you know, I guess a good essay starts with a good topic, but it does involve a lot of mentorship. So we have a dedicated team of people called application mentors who help you through this writing process. Cool. And then uh, if someone's interested in joining our program, they're wondering how much does our program or course cost? Yeah, sure. So our program generally ranges from about, you know, um, six to about 20,000 US dollars, depending on what program for a kind of standard program. And then we have VIP programs that typically are more in like the 50k USD range, um, depending on kind of what you're enrolling in. Um, but when you speak to our advisors, we can quickly give you a sense of what we think is appropriate for you, which strategists are appropriate, and then how you can enroll. But you could assume it's in the kind of six 50k USD range, depending on kind of what services you go for and kind of how much help you need. Cool. And then um, what do you think contribute to your success or differentiate you from other people? Probably my obsession with results. So, you know, from a young age, I really thought to myself, man, like I need to get into one of these top schools. And so I was very laser focused and building a good profile for these schools. And so, um, you know, when other high schoolers were sort of chilling or relaxing, you know, I was grinding out my academics. And then as I've, you know, continued to build Crimson, I focus very heavily on student outcomes at every stage. So even as we build the organization, you know, I've, I have hundreds of employees now, I still obsess over our student outcomes and how we can make our students do better. So that continual focus means that we're really quality obsessed and um, we continue to study and learn through every single admission cycle. As we get larger and larger, we have more data and insights coming in from, you know, more than 20 offices around the world. And, um, you know, I also have a real passion for education. So those things mean we've been able to attract a pretty world-class team. If you speak to most college missions firms, people that run them aren't actually particularly high achieving. They maybe have gone to a good school, but they often weren't doing that well at college. And they've come into this industry as kind of like a backup. But actually, um, our team consists of many of the highest achievers from these schools that have really you know, gone into the space because they're really passionate about education and the opportunity to build something exciting in this realm for parents. So I think, you know, if you meet the Crimson team, you'll, you'll kind of feel a bit of a difference in quality um, between our team and sort of, you know, general organizations in the US, which is why we've been able to expand quite successfully and attract significant investment capital. Awesome. Then we have Sylvia, who is interested in our internship program. Sylvia, you can scan the QR code on the screen, then we can have a uh, uh, academic advisor to speak with you and let you know more about how to join. But Meanwhile, can Jamie, can you tell us a bit more uh, about the internship program? Sure. So we have partnered with a whole variety of you know organizations around the world for both virtual and in-person internships. And um, we also have you know quite a powerful network of opportunities even within the Bay Area. And then um, what happens is you come along, um, the program is around 5K USD to 10K USD, depending on which organization we place you in. And then um, we can also assess sort of what's realistic for your current profile. We then train you for admission um, uh, or, you know, for cover letters, et cetera, and then get you placed to the partner organization. And then you can use that on your common application once you've had the work experience successfully. So um, take the boy who just got into um, Harvard from China. He did one of our remote internships for a London-based tech startup where he helped contribute to their AI matching algorithm. So um, uh, we can definitely help find interesting opportunities for your child. Amazing. Then we have a very interesting question. Uh, as Crimson has many uh, acquisitions, how do you go about identifying good targets? And do you have any tips or experience on synergy or corporate culture? Yeah, definitely. So that's a really good question. In fact, um, you know, Crimson has acquired eight different companies as we've continued to grow. Um, these companies have been in different areas. Um, usually identify companies that have synergies with our current product suite. So, you know, Crimson is, you know, world leading in college missions, age 14 to 18, 10 to 18, this kind of range. So I've purchased, you know, early learning tutoring organizations that, you know, train kids from a young age, because uh, the earlier the students begin, the more we can do with them in the college missions years. And then also I've, you know, used acquisitions to expand into new geographies. So when I first entered in China, I needed certain, certain licenses and stuff. So we acquired a company in China. I also acquired a company to get into the UK. And I've also acquired a number of companies across Australia as well. So um, I usually use companies to geographically expand through acquisition, but typically in organizations, in areas like America, I generally favor organic expansion. 
because asset prices tend to be higher in this geography. Um, as far as corporate culture, it's mission critical for success. You need to have a philosophical alignment with the founders of the company. So all of our best acquisitions that have really been tremendous successes typically have involved the founders continuing to stay and build with Crimson. So um, we really uh, do have quite a consistent set of corporate values. Um, and we've got four key values that really define our organization across the world. So I think, you know, having those values in place is very important as you grow to make sure that your staff are aligned behind your mission and focus on student outcomes. And one of our values is actually student outcome obsessed. That's like actually a value in our company's handbook. Um, and we talk about it regularly in all of our all hands meetings. Amazing. Uh, and then Emma is wondering if you can share some insights for MBA candidates for uh, arts and media. Yeah, sure. So um, first of all, uh, if you're applying for arts and media, still many of the same top MBAs are relevant. So for example, at Stanford, there was a lot of fantastic media courses um, uh, about the media industry, how it's gone through disruption, um, opportunities to get involved. So you're still often looking at some of the same top kind of like 15 programs. Um, your GPA is important. Your GRE or GMAT is important. Your work experience, community service, and leadership experience is important in the area, as well as your application essay. A natural question to ask in media and art is why do you want an MBA? So having a very persuasive narrative about why you want to do the MBA in the first place and how it links to this career goal you have and what you're going to do post the MBA is all very important. So we can help you carve out that narrative and train you up for that program. Great. Um, we will have time to ask a few more questions uh, for 10 more minutes. So please feel free to keep them coming. Meanwhile, I'm going to ask Jamie a few more. Um, do you know which college in US like debater? Personally, I think all colleges like debater, but Jamie, you can answer it in details. Yeah, sure. So I've trained many of the world's top debaters actually uh, that have gone on to these schools. So Harvard loves debaters, Stanford loves debaters um, uh, in particular. Um, so these schools will often take a lot of my debate candidates. Um, Princeton and Yale also like debaters too. But I would say Harvard generally really likes debaters. We've seen a lot of students to Harvard who have been top debaters. Um, so uh, I would say these schools have a particular preference for these types of students. Um, and schools don't really care as much, like NYU Stern, Cornell, these schools don't put as much focus on debating as an extracurricular, but it does, it does vary based on what program you're applying for. But debating is a fantastic extracurricular in general because it trains your verbal reasoning skills, your argumentative reasoning skills, it trains your essay writing skills as well, makes you more well-rounded, more interesting interviews, often more effective if you want to go into a business pathway and do, for example, you know, an MBA. Um, so when I did my Stanford MBA, even though my classmates were five years older than me, or et cetera, I had a lot of debating. So I was very comfortable to negotiate with them, et cetera. So I would, I would definitely um, say it's a good activity to have. Cool. Uh, and then we have a question about where to find your essays. Uh, I think it might be about your book that you were talking about that's coming up next. Oh week. yeah, sure. Our book gets launched in February, 2022. So like a good Fast and Furious movie, you're gonna to have to wait a little bit. So um, we'll be releasing this shortly next year and you should find it in all major bookstores around you.